The Zuckerman program is taking this academic friendship one step further. This vision of creating a bond between the United States and Israel comes from a place of love and a place of passion. On behalf of the Zuckerman Family and Institute, thank you all for coming. Shalom. I'm sure that together we're going to do wonderful things in the future for the benefit of the state of Israel. As we enter our third year, Eric and I are so proud of all of our scholars and what we have all achieved in such a short period of time. have such a wonderful, immense in impact on science and research in Israel. We are excited to see you, the scholars, the Zuckerman scholars, be leaders in your field for years to come. Welcome to the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program Reception celebrating Israel's 70th birthday and also 70 years of outstanding academic collaborations between the United States and Israel. We have now have touched 82 different scholars. We've had professors that have come back from the United States to Israel. We've worked with close to 39 different American universities. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Zuckerman family. I think of a saying that said a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. I praise and congratulate Mort Superman and Eric and Jamie Gertner and I strongly believe that advancing the career of women scientists should be a top priority. I am so pleased that this year, 54% of our scholars are women in this Open Scholarship. So, so thank you to all of you. Science is gender independent. There should be encouragement for female in science, and this is why I, did, I agreed to come to the Tuckerman Initiative. I wish all of you great scientific life. those in the United States, and good evening to those here in Israel. Welcome to the fourth annual Zuckerman U.S. Israel Symposium, coming to you live from Tel Aviv, New York, and Boston. My name is Sharon Goldman, and I'll be your MC today. The theme of today's symposium, Strength Through Partnership, strongly resonates with me. As Vice President of Global Resources at Bar Ilan University, this is what I do. 
I work in collaboration with colleagues in Israel, America, and Europe, and my job is to secure the necessary resources for Israel's top scientists and academics, thereby strengthening Israel's role as a global leader in technology and innovation. Along with the university's top researchers, academics, and administrators, I work to build global projects that support our startup nation. Speaking of partnerships, Barilan is very proud of the ongoing partnership with the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program. It's truly my honor to be here with all of you today. Today's symposium also recognizes seven new Zuckerman faculty scholars, scientists who are all opening new labs thanks to the Zuckerman Institute at seven of Israel's top universities. Congratulations. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge those in our Zoom audience, including the Zuckerman faculty, postdoc, and Israel postdoc scholars who are joining us from the United States and Israel. Welcome, everyone. It is an honor to introduce Eric J. Gertler, a trustee of the Zuckerman Institute and nephew of Mort Zuckerman, who's joining us today from New York. Eric, everyone here tonight is grateful to you and your family for making this all happen. Thank you. Please welcome Eric Gertler, who will deliver opening remarks. Shalom. I am Eric Gertler, one of the trustees of the Zuckerman Institute, greeting you from New York. And on behalf of my brother, Jamie, our uncle, Mort Zuckerman, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth annual Zuckerman Institute Symposium. I don't, I don't this year is the first year that I'm unable to travel and be there with you in person. Of course, COVID is the reason why. But although we may be physically apart and socially distanced, we are united in our belief that this program is more important than ever. A global health pandemic reinforces the importance of having great scientific leaders and a focus on discovery and growth in science. In this our fourth year, we can boast that we now have 175 scholars, 65 of whom are alums. Also today, we have seven faculty scholars representing all of the universities that we support. And also today with this new symposium, we are proud to announce a new partnership with the Council for Higher Education in which we now have 19 women postdoctorals, another important expansion of the Zuckerman Institute program. We are always trying to think of ways that we can improve and grow this program. As well today, given COVID, it reinforces two things. One, the absolute need for greater collaboration in this world. This is a global pandemic and the need for collaboration between Israeli scientific leaders and American scientific leaders is as great as ever. And two, I can tell you that we remain committed to the original vision that Mort had, that the Zuckerman Institute must support the next generation of scientific leaders in the United States and Israel. So with that, I hope you enjoy yourselves and I thank you for coming to this year's symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for your very positive remarks. We've all been absolutely blessed by more Zuckerman vision and courage. Perhaps now is the right time to say to you and Jamie, next year in Jerusalem. Our theme tonight is strength through partnership. We continue to partner with dozens of universities in Israel and the U.S., always looking for new ways to strengthen the program, to empower scholars, and to foster collaborations. Last year, we launched the MIT Israel Zuckerman STEM Fund, supporting faculty collaboration between MIT and Israeli universities. We are now looking to establish such collaboration with additional U.S. universities. The U.S. government through its embassy and other bodies here in Israel actively support us. 
our most significant continuing partnership is with the government of Israel through the Council of Higher Education. We are extremely grateful and so very proud for the support they've been giving us. It has been an absolute pleasure to work with the Council team under Professor Zilberschatz's leadership. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome the Council's dynamic chair, Professor Yaffa Zilberschatz, to speak about strength through partnership, the next era of research and academic relations. Thank you, Yaffa. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Eric and Jamie, our partners in promoting scientific excellence in Israel. Dear Zuckerman, Council for Higher Education, CHE faculty members, we are very, very happy to welcome you to our universities. Dear panelists and heads of universities from Israel and the United States who are here with us on technical uh, possibilities. Had it not been COVID-19 year, Eric and Jamie would have been here in Israel with me, shaking your hands warmly and welcoming all of you here to Israel. But COVID-19 is still here, and we hope very much that it disappears from our lives soon. Let me take this opportunity to introduce the Zuckerman CHE partnership. Led by the vision of Maud Zuckerman, the Zuckerman Foundation decided to support excellent academic research in Israel by funding top USA postdoctoral scholars in Israeli universities and by calling upon top scholars from US, USA to move to the United States. Striving for excellence and its highest level did not make this task very easy since the best scholars get attractive offers from American universities. But the Zuckerman CHE collaboration took up the challenge and made the efforts required to overcome the obstacles and create the best conditions needed to attract top scholars from USA to come to Israel and continue the groundbreaking research in our local universities. Dear awardees, you arrive in Israel during an odd period. COVID-19 prevents students from attending classes on campus. Nonetheless, we are very proud that academic studies in all of Israel's higher education institutions have continued and take place using distant learning technologies. We all know that distant learning cannot replace the classroom experience. Yet we believe that the day after COVID-19, our campuses will not look the same as before. E-learning is here to stay and will continue to develop and help promote ongoing academic education through lifelong learning, which becomes ever so important in a world where people change careers more often and need to update and upgrade their skills and knowledge to keep up with technological progress. I want to add that COVID-19 created in Israel a huge interest in academic studies. Registration to higher education institutions has increased by an average of 20%, far beyond our expectations. We are now trying to analyze and learn what caused this growth. Now let's move to research. There is no question that science has undergone and, undergone and transformation during COVID-19. It has taught us the value of data sharing and emphasize the huge importance of international collaborations for the advancements of science. It has taught us that without good science and good research, no problem can be solved. Protecting and strengthening academic research in the midst of COVID-19 requires thoughtful and concerned efforts on the part of governments, funders, universities, and academic communities. We will need to collaboratively develop, fund, and implement long-term initiatives that make the voices of researchers heard and count in national policy decision. De uh, decisions. Sustainable research systems are vital, not just 
to the success of pandemic responses, but also to the health of societies all over the world. We can do this by strengthening global partnership between countries, academia, governments, and private philanthropists. This is where the Council for Higher Education stands. We are leading the change in providing solutions for the State of Israel during this time by offering extensive resources to bring the brightest minds to Israel, provide support to women in step, partnering up with philanthropists as well with government agencies and high-tech industry. We will do our best to continue strengthening international cooperation and especially support U.S.-Israel collaborations, including the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program. I would like to thank again the Zuckerman Institute and its trustees, Eric Gertler and James Gertler, Jamie, for the support of academic excellence as a means to better our societies, for being a voice that is trusted through us Israeli academia and for the efforts to make Israel a desirable center for research capable of attracting the, sign, the, the finest minds. My very personal thanks to Ms. Lina De Shilton, who represents the Zuckerman Institute in Israel and is the best go-between I ever met. Thank you all and warm welcome to our new faculty members. We are very glad to have you here with us. Welcome all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Zilberschatz. Today we're privileged to hear a brief presentation from each of the seven New Zuckerman faculty scholars who are with us today live in the studio. I know you'll appreciate getting to know these extraordinary young people and learning a little bit about their research. First up is Dr. Morand Velalevit, a member of the Faculty of Life Sciences and Director of the Morand Velalevit Lab at Bar Ilan University. Dr. Dvela Levitt will speak about fighting traffic jams towards a better understanding of the protein trafficking network. Thank you. I am very excited to be here today and would like to share with you just in few words the research myself and my group at bar -Ilan University are excited about. In my lab, we are investigating the very basic phenomenon of intracellular protein trafficking. We are tackling some of the great enigmas in the field such as how are billions of proteins, very different from one another, are shuttled from their site of origin to their very diverse destinations all over the cells? How is the system regulated to ensure that only intact proteins will be presented by the cell, while defective and misfolded ones will be eliminated? How come in dozens of human diseases, like cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer, these pathways go awry causing cellular traffic jams? And finally, how can we combat these malfunctions, outsmart the cellular trafficking machinery, and develop new therapeutic approaches? So how are we going to address all of that? My lab is heavily based on imaging techniques. Through a very sophisticated high-content imaging microscope, we are planning to perform biological and pharmacological screenings to comprehensively understand the trafficking network. To do that, we are using different model systems, two of which you can see here on the screen. Here is a cell we derived from a patient suffering from a kidney disease in which the cellular trafficking machinery doesn't behave well, promoting an entrapment of the green protein, leading eventually to a kidney failure. And here is an example of human-derived kidney organoid, which is basically a mini organ grown in a dish. A model system derived directly from patients that better recapitulate human physiology and pathophysiology. Using, using these model systems, together with the screening facility, we are investigating protein trafficking in human health and disease. The amazing network and generous support of the Zuckerman program will enable us to fulfill these goals by conducting a high quality and competitive scientific research. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to see what the future holds. Thank you, Dr. Dvela Levitt, for that fascinating insight. We now welcome Dr. Alon Ron, who directs the Alon Ron Lab in the School of Physics and Astronomy at Tel Aviv University, which is also where he earned his PhD in physics. Dr. Ron will speak on quantum material properties by design. The floor is yours. 
Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alain Ron, and I recently started to work on my new lab in Tel Aviv University. The main goal of this lab is to push the field of material research in a new direction, which I personally find fascinating, changing the properties of materials using light. The best way to explain how this is done without delving too deeply into the physics is by making an analogy to a well-known example from simple mechanics, the pendulum. Like many materials, the pendulum is a useful object. We can use its periodic motion to count time and build clocks. In analogy to material research, one can try and optimize the function of the pendulum to one's needs by changing its components, for example, the mass tied at its end or the length of its rod. This could be used to change the periodicity of the pendulum, making it oscillate slowly or rapidly, but doesn't change what the pendulum does, which is to oscillate pointing down. This is analogous in material research to slight modifications of material composition to suit one's needs. What I want to do is different. Think of a pendulum which could be shaking back and forth at its anchoring point. This is known as the Capizzo pendulum. What happens, as you can see in the video, is that the pendulum will start oscillating upside down. In analogy, what I want to do in the lab is to come with strong pulses of laser light and use their electromagnetic field to periodically shake the atoms in a material, hope uh, to completely flip the material's physical properties upside down. This is a challenging task, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful for the Zuckerman Institute in helping me pursue it. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Ron, for that, for that interesting, interesting presentation. presentation. Our, Our next speaker, speaker is Zuckerman faculty, faculty scholar, Dr. Dr. Netta Schlesinger, whose lab at the Koretz School of Veterinary Medicine and the Robert H. Smith Faculty of Agriculture, Food, and Environment is at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Rehovot. Her title today is Tackling Emerging Fungal Superbug Threats to Human Health, Agriculture, and Ecosystem Resilience. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, People inhale, consume, or otherwise come in contact with microscopic fungi every day. And each year, nearly 2 million people die of fungal infections. This uh, number is compounded by climate change, immunosuppressive medicine, and the rapid evolution of multidrug resistant fungal strains. Since fungal uh, pathogens are eukaryotes, they, they share uh, significant similarities with their hosts. And the similarity uh, greatly complicates the task of identifying selective drugs that kill the fungus without harming the person, animal, or plant infected with it. To address the emergency of multidrug resistance in fungi, my team and I endeavor to answer several most basic and pressing questions, like how do fungal cells die, how does our immune system combat them, and how can we use this knowledge to develop novel antifungal treatments? To answer this question, we established a system of color-coded fluorescent biosensors that enable us to visualize individual host pathogen encounters in real time during infection. And it was using this technique that I discovered how our innate immune system triggers a programmed cell death mechanism in fungal cells, making them self-destruct through the activation of designated fungal proteins. But this exciting discovery barely uh, scratches the surface of what we may still learn about the vulnerabilities of pathogenic fungi. And ongoing projects in the lab are now aimed at identifying additional fungal and host proteins that mediate this process, which we think will be a rich source for uh, drug targets that are not prone to have fungi develop resistance. And I believe that exploration of these intricate interactions will advance our understanding of the fascinating biology of fungi while also pinpointing new targets for development of much needed antifungal and perhaps more generally uh, antimicrobial treatments. I uh, cannot commend the Zuckerman STEM leadership program enough. The uh, participating scholars are all of uh, outstanding quality and our routine uh, intercommunications help us all to improve our game. So uh, thank you so much for your support. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Schlesinger. Our, Our next speaker is Zuckerman faculty scholar, Dr. Ariel Fisher from the Technion, who you've already heard earlier this evening. Now we get to hear her speak about her own research. Her title today is Biomechanical Interventions and Wearable Technology for Improving Human Movement. Zuckerman Institute, fellow STEM researchers, colleagues, proud families, and friends. It's an honor to be selected as a Zuckerman faculty scholar. My research focuses on the human muscle skeletal system, a remarkable engineering system that enables movement with natural ease in healthy people, 
with wonderfully coordinated interaction between bones, muscles, ligaments, and joints. Yet its complexity makes it difficult to understand and treat muscle skeletal injuries and diseases. I'm interested in the fundamental principles that shape how we, we move, the way we move, and application of technologies to enhance mobility and overall health. My research goals apply biomechanical principles to human motion and implement wearable sensor systems with the goal of finding interventions to correct muscle skeletal pathologies and develop new tools and infrastructure for biomedical data integration to drive personalized methods for early detection, intervention, and prevention of movement disorders. As a Tsukraman faculty scholar, I established the Biomechanics and Wearable Tech Lab at the Technion's Biomedical Engineering Department. My overarching aim is to investigate the complex nature of joint disorders, such as osteoarthritis, with a multidisciplinary approach, combining movement mechanics, biology, structure, and quality of life data. According to recent clinical guidelines, there is a need for novel approaches and non-pharmacological interventions to mitigate pain, improve motor skills, and reduce disability after injury. My lab's team will tackle this problem and include researchers from diverse backgrounds, including biomedical, mechanical, and electrical engineers, physiotherapists, and biologists, in close collaboration with multiple hospitals and clinics, sports organizations and military units, we will use these technologies, motion biomechanics analysis, novel imaging techniques, and biomarkers to study at-risk populations, including patients, athletes, and soldiers who have sustained injuries and or surgeries. We explore the nature of joint disorders, develop and apply smart wearable devices to improve rehabilitation, and deliver biofeedback for improved motor learning and function. We are interested in collecting big data using wearable technologies, such as I mentioned above, in natural environments, athletes and soldiers in the field, patients in the clinic, and apply machine learning algorithms to build predictive tools for early detection and prevention of such pathologies. This research has the potential to transform the clinical approach to joint diseases through innovative solutions. It's an honor for me to receive this award and recognition of my work. I look forward to future collaborations with my fellow Zuckerman faculty scholars and the Zuckerman Institution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fisher. Our next speaker is a Zuckerman postdoctoral scholar who will present his research with a twist. Dr. David Greenberg is doing his postdoctoral research in the Department of Social Sciences at Barilan. Previously, he earned his PhD in psychology from the University of Cambridge in the UK, and he will speak about One World in Song, Evidence from Big Data and Social Neuroscience. Thank you, Sharon. I'm a psychologist, social neuroscience, and also a musician, and I study the impact of music on individuals and society. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to describe uh, some of the most recent findings um, from my work in big data and social neuroscience. Um, we've been mapping musical preferences all around the world, and from 250,000 people in 53 different countries, we found that musical preferences are driven in part by people's personality traits, that levels of empathy and openness and agreeableness all contribute to what makes our musical taste. And also, in addition, our musical preferences are what helps bind people together into groups. And um, this has led us to try to map the social brain uh, when people are coming together to make music. And in collaboration with the University of Chicago, we begin to map the brain functions of when people get together and sing together and play music. We've identified empathy circuits as well as um, oxytocin and dopamine pathways that are key um, uh, components that help uh, to contribute to what makes the group bonding experience when we make music. Uh, just this past winter, we also conducted a study in the wild in collaboration with the Icon School of Medicine and looked at 60 singers when they sing for four days straight together in a workshop. And we noticed that after those four days, the singers had a 37 decrease in depressive symptoms and a 33% increase in group bonding. We're now working with the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, which brings together um, really brave Arab and Jewish teenagers from East and West Jerusalem to try to overcome social conflict and cross-cultural barriers through music. Um, all of these findings are pointing to music to be a prime vehicle to increase strength through partnership. 
I told you there would be a twist, and here it is. We'll now be treated to a musical performance by David Greenberg's Yeshaya, David's Dream Ensemble. Thank you for that special treat, David, to you and your wonderful band. And it's an honor now for me to introduce James Gertler, also a trustee of the Zuckerman Institute and nephew of Mort Zuckerman, who's joining us today from New York. Thank you, James, for your generosity and support of the sciences as reflected in today's wonderful program. James' topic tonight is Women in STEM First and Why It Matters. Please welcome James Gertler. Good evening, everyone. I hope you are enjoying tonight's symposium as much as I am. As my brother Eric said earlier, I regret I can't be with you this evening. I always look forward to the excitement 
and energy of each symposium, but unfortunately, these unusual times prevent me from meeting you in person and visiting our Zuckerman Institute friends and partners in Israel. It's an honor to share the stage with this impressive group of outstanding scholars, even if remotely. I want to congratulate our newest cohort of Zuckerman STEM scholars, including our seven Israeli faculty scholars who are being recognized here this evening. Thank you for being part of Israel's brain game which we continue to invest in through the Faculty Scholars Program. I wish you the best of luck as you open your new laboratories, and I know we will hear great things from each of you. Today's new laboratories are tomorrow's great discoveries. This year's symposium celebrates the strength of our partnerships and gives us the opportunity to thank those who work with us to make the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program the success it is. Universities in the US and Canada, universities in Israel, the Israeli government, and of our course, our uncle Mort Zuckerman for his vision to support the collaborative efforts and academic partnerships within the STEM communities in Israel and the United States. I especially want to thank our dear friend and partner from Israel's Council for Higher Education, Professor Yaffa Zibershatz, now in our partner for Zuckerman Council for Higher Education Israeli Women Postdoctoral Program. I also want to thank Daniel Chaimovitz, president of Ben Gurion University in the Negev, one of our Israeli partner universities, who we will hear from shortly. At last year's symposium, we celebrated women in STEM and the fact for the first time, the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program counted more women participants than men. And we say on our website, and as a father of two amazing girls, advancing women in STEM is more than a slogan. You know the definition of a genius? An average student with Jewish parents. This year, 64% of the 2020-2021 Zuckerman Scholars are women, an outstanding group of individuals who are making an impact in genetics, biology, medical technology, environment, and climate science, physics and robotics, to name a few. We are so proud to lead the way forward in advancing women in STEM, and this year, we have taken that support a step further with the new initiative, together with our existing partner, the Israeli Council for Higher Education. Since the program began a few months ago, it is supporting 16 Israeli women postdoc scholars at 14 American universities, among them MIT, Harvard, Duke, UC San Diego, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, Berkeley, NYU, Stony Brook, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and the Ragon Institute of Mass General. Quite an impressive list, made even more impressive by the research being conducted in neuroscience, engineering, quantum and particle physics, cancer research, infectious diseases, genetics, data science, and machine learning and atomic energy. In addition to their impactful research and significant discoveries, these women are paving the way for other female scientists and creating an important network of leaders in their respective fields. They're forming collaborative partnerships with their peers in the United States and Israel, such an integral part of the Zuckerman Institute's vision that Mort Zuckerman initiated, and one we continue to support. Speaking of women who are paving the way, how fortunate are we to have Daniela Russ with us today? There's probably no stronger advocate for women in STEM today. She is the pioneer in her own right, both in the fields of robotics and artificial intelligence. And as the first woman to head MIT's computer science 
and in artificial intelligence lab. Daniela, your commitment to advancing the role of women in STEM is truly inspiring. I want to thank you for joining us today. This brings me to our next speaker, one of Israeli Zuckerman scholars who is on the cutting edge of COVID-19 research. I'm looking forward to hearing from Tal Gilboa as she speaks to us from her lab at Harvard's Weiss Institute. I want to thank all of our speakers, scholars, and participants for joining us today, and many special thanks to everyone who helped organize this year's symposium. I wish you all good health and continued success in the year ahead. And over the next little while, please wear your mask and be safe. Thank you for your meaningful words, James. We now welcome Dr. Tal Gilboa, who is a Zuckerman postdoctoral scholar, meaning she's originally Israeli, and she's now doing her postdoctoral research at Harvard Medical School at the Wies Institute. Previously, she earned her PhD in the Biomedical Engineering Department of the Technion, Israeli Institute of Technology. Dr. Gilboa's timely topic is from her lab at the Wies Institute at Harvard at the forefront of COVID-19 research. Hello, Zuckerman U.S. Israel Symposium. My name is Tal Gilboa. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Walt Lab here in the Wies Institute in Harvard University and in Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard Medical School. I'm thrilled to represent women in STEM, and I'm excited to share my research with you, which is focused on developing ultra-sensitive single molecule technologies and adapting them for advanced diagnostics. This is an interdisciplinary research which involves collaborations between clinicians, scientists, and engineers. And specifically, the method we are developing here in the lab is called Single Molecule Arrays, or SIMOA. And in this technology, we are using micro wells to trap single molecules and to uh, confine their fluorescent signal. And here in the image behind me, you can see a micro well array. And in the fluorescence image, you will see these bright blue dots, where each dot represents a signal from a single enzyme that was trapped in those femtoliter-sized wells. And we can monitor its activity over time and quantify it at the single molecule level. Now, this technology allows us to detect biomarkers with high sensitivity and high accuracy using small amount of sample and also to resolve small changes between different individuals as well as within a single patient. Now, before the pandemic, I was very excited to use this method and develop new tools specifically for early detection of neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's, which are very hard to detect before clear symptoms are apparent. However, it all changed when the pandemic started and it was only natural for us to adapt our work for COVID-19 research. We quickly began collaborations with the clinicians in the hospital. And on our side, we developed bead-based digital SIMOA assays uh, to detect antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, as well as the viral antigen and the viral RNA. We developed a serology test which really profiles the immune response against SARS-CoV-2. We're using a multiplexed assay to probe different interactions between antibody isotypes and antigen. And we showed that the high sensitivity of our assay allows to detect seroconversion very early, only one day after symptom onset, with less than one microliter of blood. Our assay has a very high resolution, which allows to quantify the full range of disease from the very early stage to the very late stage. We also combine this test with direct antigen detection, and we showed that patients with severe disease tend to have high levels of the viral antigen in their blood. 
We were also able to measure the viral antigen, the viral RNA, and the antibodies in saliva samples of COVID-19 patients. And this could be very useful for clinicians to get the full picture of the disease and to decide how to treat the patients. Our assays can be run on this automated high throughput instrument which was placed in the clinical lab in the hospital during the pandemic. And this platform really provides a powerful analytical tool that we now use to try and answer questions about the pandemic, to understand the immune response in adults as well as in kids, and to help develop and um, test new vaccines uh, for the disease. I'm now working on this COVID-19 research while also coming back to my original research and trying to combine all of that while being a mother to two young girls in these challenging, uncertain days, as you all know. Uh, and I would really like to uh, thank the Zuckerman Institute for their support. I feel really happy and lucky to be a part of this family uh, and thank you all and uh, that's it for now bye bye thank, thank you dr, dr. Gilbert, for, your for your enlightening talk, talk. We're, we're now, now honored, honored to welcome professor, professor daniel heimovitz pres president of ben gurion university of the negev, of the negev. Professor, professor heimovitz grew up in the united, united states, states but he received his phd in genetics from the hebrew university of jerusalem, of jerusalem. So, so he really embodies the international spirit of the zuckerman program his 2012 book, What a Plant Knows, has been translated into 18 languages. Professor Heimovitz's topic today is the future of academic research post-COVID-19. Please welcome Professor Daniel Heimovitz. Shalom. It's a pleasure for me to be with you, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, COVID-19 has influenced the universities in so many ways and like in other parts of society, it's exposed both strengths and weaknesses. I'd just like to take the next couple of minutes to talk about how this has affected us and what it's shown in terms of research and in education. In terms of research, the bottom line is, I think what we've now is clear, not only to us, but to all of society, is the importance of research that comes out of publicly funded research from large research universities like the universities in Israel. That Everything that we benefit from in society, from technology, from medicine, originated from research within universities. And I could use what's happened over the past nine months at Ben Gurion University as a paradigm. On March 11th, I issued a public call to the university, just as the pandemic was starting in Israel, for any researcher in any field who had some type of idea or wanted to contribute to come to my office, to have a hackathon of professors, to put the problems on the table and see how we could work together to come up with immediate um, research, immediate impact for the COVID epidemic. The next day on March 12th, over 60 PIs, 60 professors showed up in the meeting room next to my office. And over the course of three or four hours, we threw out ideas, said, what can we do together? Within two weeks, we had funded internally over 20 research projects in fields from, um, from social sciences, through medicine, through life sciences, through engineering, which over the past months have had immediate effect on Israel. Out of this research, seven patents were developed, four companies were set up, and we've had daily impact on what's going on in Israel. And this has been true for, for all of the universities in Israel. What this shows us, is that the paradigm is, is that basic research leads to the best applied research, which is then implemented in companies. All of the vaccines that everyone is so excited about is based on publicly funded research in universities. Go back again to the history of uh, Ben Gurion University in the corona crisis. On March 6th at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, we only had five online courses. On March 9th, we had over 2,000. What we've learned from this over the past nine months is that online education is not an answer for everything, but it is an answer for some of our students. What we've realized 
is that the classroom learning was not ideal for some of our students, just like online learning isn't ideal for some of our students. That we need to offer our students a wide variety of modalities to increase their chances of success. In other words, we, need, can, we can increase the accessibility of higher education by adopting some of the online capabilities that we have learned over the past nine months while enabling on-campus education for those who need it. By offering vast modalities, we will, we will increase our chance of encouraging excellence. And in the end, this will increase our chance of finding the excellence of research that I talked about ahead of time. And all this really comes down to what is the importance of the Zuckerberg Foundation, who are identifying the best and the brightest of Israeli academics and making sure that they find their positions back in Israeli academia. Without these young, I call them stars, running their own independent research labs, talking with students, teaching the next generation, and being innovative, we wouldn't be able to do all these wonderful things we've done over the past nine months. I'm so thankful to the Zuckerberg Foundation and to the trustees, Eric and James Gertner, who have enabled um, this excellence and are committed to excellence in Israeli higher education. So to sum up, COVID-19 has exposed weaknesses in universities in Israel and around the world, but we have quickly adapted. I think what we'll see is that higher education, research coming out of higher education, will have less silos, will have less barriers, and will be more flexible in the way that we work. And in the end, we see the importance of problem-based research. Not discipline-based research, but problem-based research, which brings together people from different disciplines to really provide solutions for the key issues of our age. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'm really excited to hear what the rest of the speakers will provide us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Heimovitz, for your enlightening words about universities and the Zuckerman Foundation. Now we continue with our live presentation from the seven new Zuckerman faculty scholars who are with us today in the studio. Our next presentation is by Dr. Yossi Weitzman, a member of the Department of Chemistry at Ben Gurion University in the Negev. Dr. Weitzman heads the Weitzman Lab for Synthetic Nucleic Acid and Plasmonic Nanomaterials Design Group. He will speak today about detection of biochemical and medically relevant targets. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Yossi Wiseman. I am from the chemistry department at Ben Gurion University. Today, I want to talk a bit about what we are doing in my lab. So in my group, we have two main directions. The first is to use synthetic nucleic acid to develop the next generation bio biosensors. Sensors that can detect viruses and bacteria. Sensors that can detect protein and even cancer cells. Our sensors are fast and they can operate in real time. They consume very low energy and therefore we can use them at the point of care. In the field, without the need to ship back the samples to the lab. In another area, we are using synthetic nucleic acid to understand biological processes. We design and engineer topological probe specifically to target topoisomerase activities in vitro and in vivo. Topoisomerases are key enzymes that associate with DNA and have an important role in the regulation of DNA. Therefore, they are an excellent target for the discovery of new antibacterial drugs. Today, more than 750,000 people are dying each year from infection diseases that are related to antibiotic resistance. And by 2050, this number is expected to reach 10 million. Yes, based on the World Health Organization study, 10 million people may die each year from infection diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, antibiotic resistance is the next global crisis. Now I would like to thank to the Zuckerman Foundation for the supporting my research group, and it is a great honor for me to be a part of this wonderful family. I truly appreciate it, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Weitzman.
Our next faculty scholar presentation is by Dr. Yael Kiro, a member of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences and head of the Yael Kiro Lab at the Weizmann Institute. Dr. Kiro's topic today is revealing processes on Earth using the geochemistry of sediments and water. Hello and good evening. Thank you for your support. Because of your support, I am building now an ultra clean laboratory to process water and sediment samples. I'm focusing on two research topics, coastal aquifers and past climate. My motivation for studying coastal aquifers is driven by the fact that a large portion of the world's population lives in coastal regions and rely on fresh groundwater. Anthropogenic effects, such as extensive pumping of fresh water and sea level rise, cause seawater intrusion into the coastal aquifer. And it is important to understand the groundwater flow dynamics in these systems. Another importance is the role of coastal aquifers in ocean chemistry, which is an overlooked process and is significant to the carbon budget and understanding past, present, and future climate change. In order to understand these important issues, my group and myself collect water samples that we process in the clean lab. My other interest is reconstructing past climate from terrestrial and marine cores and sediments during warm periods in order to understand the effect of climate change. In my lab, we process sediments and water samples to achieve precise measurements of the chemical composition that we use to learn about all of these important processes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Kiro. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Zuckerman faculty scholar, Dr. Shani Stern, a member of the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Haifa. Dr. Stern heads the Shawnee Stern Lab for Precision Disease Modeling, and precision disease modeling is the topic that she will be speaking about today. In my lab, we model human brain disease and disorders by reprogramming adult cells into induced pluripotent stem cells. We then differentiate these stem cells into neurons and other brain cells. The derived neurons have the exact same DNA as the human patient. We use electrophysiology. This is a method that allows us to see specific currents and potentials from the derived neurons to look for differences when we compare to the healthy neurons. We use other molecular methods as well as computational models to complement the electrophysiology and to find mechanisms that contribute to the disease phenotypes. My lab currently focuses on three diseases and disorders, bipolar disorder, Parkinson's disease, and mutations that cause autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disabilities. In these disorders and diseases, we take uh, two directions. First, we are looking to find the differences with the healthy individuals. We will try to use blockers and modulators to reverse changes that we find in ion channels or in neurotransmitter receptors. Second, we are seeking biomarkers that we can employ in our computational models to predict disease prognosis, such as predicting response to drug treatment, the disease onset, or those patients who are likely to deteriorate faster and therefore need special attention. I'm deeply honored to be chosen for the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program. I believe that my research will supply much needed information about these diseases. This fellowship allows me to purchase state-of-the-art electrophysiological equipment and microscopes. My lab can now reprogram many lines despite the expensive cost of reprogramming. And I have already started collaborations with clinicians for the investigation of these disorders. I'm extremely grateful and thankful for being chosen for this program. And this program has opened enormous opportunities for my research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stern. I've really enjoyed our time together. Now I'm going to pass you on to Lena de Shilton, the wonderful executive director of the Zuckerman Institute in Israel. Thank you, Sharon, for being such a stimulating moderator. It was really an honor to work with you. And I'd like to thank you for taking on this role. Now, now, I'd, I'd like, like to, to turn to, to our Zoom, Zoom participants. Where are they? Definitely the largest audience we've ever had for one of our symposium. Unfortunately, I've only been able to physically meet a few of our scholars this year, something which was always one of the biggest pleasures of my work in Israel. I want to use this opportunity to show my appreciation to all of our scholars and I would like to invite you to join me 
in a, sh in a giant show of applause to our scholars and all of those who have made our program possible. Please unmute your microphones now if you wish to clap and be heard. Thank you. Thank you all. Now I'm going to say goodbye, but please remain for a special treat. David Greenberg and his band will perform Encore as they send off to you. Thank you, David.